Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus channel. In order to maintain full operational readiness, the United States and many other countries perform a variety of exercises, drills, and training events. One of the most important of all of these is ICE-X, an Arctic military exercise designed to test Army, Air Force, and Navy capabilities in extremely cold conditions. The ICE-X exercise typically involves the deployment of submarines, surface ships, and aircraft as well as ground personnel. These men and women will then perform a variety of drills with their international partners to improve their overall cold weather performance. Submarines play an essential part in ICE-X, as they must operate in icy conditions while also dealing with ice flows and other obstacles. The USS Hartford is a Los Angeles-class submarine launched in the early 90s. At more than 6,000 tons and 360 feet long, the sub is a large and imposing weapon. The average U.S. sub can break through ice up to three feet thick. However, if the crew were to make a mistake while surfacing through the ice, it could damage the sub beyond repair. The process involves using sonar to locate a thin spot in the ice flow, then slowly pumping the ballast tanks with air to raise the sub. This must be done slowly, with crew members closely monitoring all systems for signs of a potential problem. As they generally travel under the water to avoid detection, one of the primary weapons used by submarines is the torpedo. These are large, self-propelled range weapons designed to be used against other sea vessels. Because they are so large, they can do immense damage to their targets often breaking the enemy ship's hull so it starts sinking almost immediately. Aboard submarines, torpedoes are stored in weapon stowage compartments that feature connected torpedo tubes. During a battle, torpedoes will be loaded into these tubes, which are then flooded to allow for launch. During exercises like ICE-X, the U.S. military will almost never use live torpedoes. Instead, test torpedoes will be used. These perform nearly identically to their counterparts, but do not have an attached warhead. Once fired, the torpedo will generally travel until its internal propulsion system gives out. When that happens, divers must enter the frigid water in order to retrieve the stranded weapon. 
This poses a significant risk to everyone involved, as the divers must often operate under thick ice. Once the torpedo is located, the divers will generally call in assistance from a helicopter. The average Mark 48 torpedo weighs as much as 3,500 pounds, making it impossible for the divers to recover independently. Therefore, they will generally cut a hole in the ice and swim under it to attach riggings to the torpedo's hull. Once the test torpedo is fully clear of the ice, it will be taken back to the nearest base for defueling. After which, weapons technicians will attempt to recover any critical data from the guidance system. U.S. military divers participate in a number of different recovery operations, including those designed to retrieve entire ships. A good example of such an operation was the investigation of the Coimbra, a vessel that sunk off the coast of New Jersey in 1942 after being torpedoed by a German U-boat. When it was discovered that the ship had the potential to start leaking oil, U.S. Coast Guard divers were sent down to depths of more than 180 feet in an attempt to siphon the oil out safely before it could enter the ocean and disturb the environment. ROVs, otherwise known as remotely operated vehicles, played a significant role in the Coimbra operation. These underwater robots are controlled by operators on the surface using a tethered cable and can be used for applications ranging from simple exploration to inspection, maintenance, and recovery. Most modern ROVs are equipped with cutting tools, grappling hooks, or other specialized equipment to assist in the recovery process. The ROVs used in the Coimbra recovery operation were equipped with high-resolution cameras and lights, sonar systems, and manipulators' arms. They not only helped investigate the wreck before divers were sent down, but played a role in attaching the equipment that would pump the oil out of the ship's tanks. In the case of the Coimbra, the ship had several million gallons of oil on board, all of which needed to be carefully transferred to a waiting surface vessel. Though the main priority of the Coimbra operation was to retrieve the oil, the U.S. Coast Guard also needed to test the samples they recovered. Working with the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, Several vessels worked for days pumping the oil from the ocean floor into waiting tanks.
Throughout the operation, divers remained at the shipwreck to make sure no oil leaked out during the process. One of the ships that played a prominent role in this process was the MV Shalia Bordelon. This specially outfitted vessel is equipped for deep water diving, ROV operations, and hazardous material testing. It was also provided with multiple deck tanks to store the recovered oil and transport it safely back to shore for proper disposal. Though environmental concerns are an excellent reason to launch a recovery operation, the U.S. Navy prioritizes the recovery of any military aircraft or vessel. This is due to the fact that these vessels often contain expensive equipment, weapons, and data that the military does not want to fall into enemy hands. One of the most extensive naval salvage operations of this kind took place in 2015. Earlier in the year, an FA-18 Super Hornet had suffered engine problems shortly after taking off from the USS Theodore Roosevelt. Though both pilots were able to eject safely, the plane itself soon sank to the bottom of the ocean, nearly 200 feet down. A Super Hornet cost roughly $70 million, and though the plane was indeed a total loss, the U.S. military was eager to recover the aircraft so that any useful parts could be salvaged. As the incident happened in international waters, it was important that no hostile countries get a chance to recover the aircraft first. Unfortunately, the operation was complicated by the fact that the plane broke apart during the crash. This made it imperative that the Navy's mobile diving salvage unit locate all sections of the aircraft so as not to leave any trace of the crash behind. The recovery consisted of divers and ROVs going down to the wreck and attaching hoists to each part of the plane. This allowed surface vessels to use powerful cranes and winches to pull the airplane slowly up from the depths. Once on board the ship's deck again, the F-18 was carefully evaluated before being packed away for shipment back to the mainland. Of course, whenever a plane crashes out at sea, the number one priority is to rescue the pilots. Because of the speed at which aircraft travel, it's possible for ejecting pilots to end up hundreds of miles away from the aircraft carrier they launched from. Immediately after a crash, the launch vessel and any surrounding vessels will deploy helicopters to perform a search and rescue mission. Helicopters like the MH-60S Seahawk are able to travel slowly over the water to locate lost personnel more efficiently. Once in place, they can lower hoists and other rescue equipment while hovering in place. This is a big reason why any ship carrying aircraft will almost always carry helicopters. Moreover, this is why the U.S. Coast Guard and other organizations dedicated to maritime search and rescue always have helicopters in their fleet. When it comes to recovering personnel or property, 
they can execute a rescue faster and more efficiently than any other vehicle. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.